Hello, dead and lovely listeners, and welcome to Dead and Lovely Horror Movie Review Podcast. Here's your good buddy, Uncle Ben. And who's that? Who's that? That sexy West Coast voice I got on the other end of this Skype line here. In W O, it's Hollywood <laughs> Steve Spratling. <laughs> Oh, Hollywood Steve. Listen, uh, it's inevitable. I mean, uh, people are already... I mean, we haven't released an episode yet, but people are already emailing saying, when are you guys doing a live show? Come on, where's the live show? The moment right, we right. do a live show, I'm going to I'm gonna get a big WCW World Championship belt, and I'm going to spray paint yep. NWO on the side, and I'm going to wear it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm thinking is like, the way that I'm over here on the East Coast... Uh-huh. Uh, over here on the Crip side, and you're over there on the West Coast side, over there on mm-hmm. that blood, I'm blood. side. Mm-hmm. I'm really thinking what we could do for the world that would really bring us all together in our in these trying times is if we have a Latin if we have a Latin king on the show. Oh, thank God! Yeah, we need a Latin king. Yeah, <laughs> somebody uh, from Latania. Um. Yeah, just bring them all together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and death that threats are coming great. soon. <laughs> We're so- <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, I'll be honest with you. I think you can talk shit about the Bloods, Crips, Latin Kings, MS-13, etc., 18th Street Gang, all you want online. They're never going to care. The second you say anything about an alt-right person, 50,000 people are going to be like, fuck you, <laughs> you're an asshole, you <laughs> cuck. They're ready, dude. They're looking. They're- yeah. If I could count how many times I have been called a, a cuck. Yeah, yeah. It's, My yeah. God, man, it's mm-hmm. just it is fucking intense. These people are out, out to be angered, basically. And, and you know, every time they say it, I'm like, I'm letting you fuck my wife. I don't understand why you're calling me names. Yeah, what's going on with this? <laughs> so, how's that West Coast life been treating you this week, Steve? Really good. Uh, my wife and I recently got a dog. Um, yeah. She is an eight-year-old rat terrier dachshund mix. She's adorable as fuck. She's got little T-Rex arms. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, what else have we been doing? Oh, um, just watched, uh, rewatched Fargo season two with my wife. I keep hearing that Fargo is amazing, but I haven't watched it. You you got to watch it. You absolutely have to watch it. Fargo season two um, is up there as one of I think one of the best seasons of television ever made. Um, How does it stack up to the second season of Dinosaurs? Oh. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. Now, <laughs> there are a number of times where they do say not the mama in okay. Fargo season two, and I really appreciated that, yeah. but I really wanted them to dive into that that episode where the, the Bart Simpson dinosaur the the boy yeah started taking steroids oh my god i was fucking so hoping that you were about to start talking about that (laughs) episode that was such an insane episode dude that show like it got really weird and really dark like there was that episode and then there's the episode where like the there's like that huge monster like the huge mega dinosaur that's gonna like kill everybody or something Yes, and the end of the show was like them going extinct. It's, it's it was dark. It's it's kind of like you know, I don't want to go on too too deep about this because we got a lot to cover on the show. But recently, right, uh, Kate and I, my wife and I, rewatched the Never Ending Story for the first time in probably about ten or fifteen years. <laughs> it is so much darker than you remembered. Yeah, it's really dark, dude. Between Absolutely. between like that movie plus like the Dark Crystal plus uh-huh. Labyrinth plus like Flight of the Navigator plus Never Ending To or, or uh, fucking Brave Little Toaster. Yeah, I feel like all of these childhood filmmakers were just basically trying to fill us all in at an early age of like what late in life depression is like. Get ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Go ahead and buckle up, kids. It's not going to be fun. Here's what it's kind of going to be like. Get ready. Well, it was it was the Ooh. 80s. Everybody was coming down off of Coke. That's uh, a good point. So good. But yeah, we, we we watched that again recently, and it was fucking crazy. I wa- I've actually been watching a ton, a ton of flicks lately, but those are ones that I definitely want to kind of cover on the show as we go along here. Oh, yeah. But, I, um, I also highly, highly recommend Legion. 
Dude, okay, several people this week have told me how sick Legion is. What's it on right now? It's amazing. Uh, it's on FX, and the uh, as of this recording, the final episode was was yesterday. Is it on Hulu? Um, yeah, yeah, it's oh, on Hulu. Um, I have that. I gotta watch it. Yeah, it's so amazing, and it's it's made by Noah Hawley, who does Fargo. Okay. Um, it, I'm telling you. Once you watch uh, any like Fargo season one, season two, uh, Legion, whatever, you're gonna think, did an alien come to Earth, uh, Dario Argento style, yeah, and teach us how television should be made? <laughs> Damn, it's amazing. Like the stuff they pull off in in um, in Fargo and in Legion, like the the insane things that you would imagine, like you couldn't do that in a television show. They do it, and it's it's just it works so perfectly. I, I really love it. So, I've heard the word psychedelic attached to Legion. Yes, yeah, Legion is a mind fuck a lot of the time, and it's about Professor X's son, Legion. Correct? Yeah, in yeah, it's about universe. David Holler. Yeah, the who you know uh, went back in time and. Tried to save Professor X and then yeah. accidentally got him killed starting the Age of Apocalypse. Spoilers. One of my favorite alternate universe storylines in, in comic books. The Age of Apocalypse storyline is my favorite in the entire comics universe. Thank you for mentioning that. I, I have been obsessed with that ever since it started. I love the AOA saga. They did some great stuff there. Uh, Blink, bringing back Blink was amazing. I really love Blink. Uh, they introduced Morph. From the cartoons, they oh. turned Morph into a character for the Age of Apocalypse. That was awesome. Well, he was in the Astonishing X Men line too. Yeah, dude. Which, yeah, that was the that was with Sabretooth and yeah. Wild Child and it, Magneto. Dude. That was a Fuck badass. Yeah. Like, exactly, dude. All that stuff yeah. is the best. Like the Astonishing X Men was easily my favorite of the uh, Age of Apocalypse storyline. Generation X was a close second, but like, yeah, the big advantage of Age of Apocalypse is like. You had Blink in there. You had Sunfire in there. Sunfire's story was super tragic. Yeah. And most importantly, you had, I think the first time that I really saw the artwork of Joe Matarara, who was uh -huh. absolutely the fucking king of like mid late nineties comic books, the coolest. Yeah. yeah. He. Uh. Yeah. What What he does so well there is that he he was seemed to be moving away from the extreme, like all Rob the pockets and style. everything. Mm. You know, like. The, uh, yeah, people weren't carrying around big guns in Astonishing X-Men. Right. Uh, I really like, yeah, it's, it's a amazing. It, anybody, check that out. Uh, if you're checking out comic books, though, by the way, uh, Miss Marvel is still one of the best comics being made. So I haven't read it. Go for it. Oh, yeah, Miss Marvel's great. And The Vision. Have you read Vision? Oh, my God, dude. So my buddy Joe just got me the first trade paperback of that, which I think is the first. Yeah. Maybe four or six issues, and it's fucking mind-blowing. And then he just recently got the second trade paperback, and he said that it like it straight up had him like weeping reading this fucking book. Yeah. And I believe it, because that, that first series was an incredible just observation of what it means to be human. It's yeah. fucking amazing, dude. Yeah. I uh, yeah, love it. I think we may have actually talked about this before on the show, so <laughs> we highly recommend it. Go read it. Clearly, we do. Uh, but the biggest thing that we're here to kind of cover today is a little, a little pellicula that we both took in this week by the name of El Exorcisto, aka The Exorcist from nineteen seventy fucking three. William Friedkin. Um. Okay. So. <laughs> This, is this our first 70s movie? A 70s I, American movie? I think so. I think we so. We did Dario Argento, uh, well, 70s, I think. But was Phenomena in the 70s or was it? No, well, but, it was uh, Suspiria. Yeah. Um, this is our first 70s American movie. So this is the first time we get to talk about the era of cinema run by the most egotistical, <laughs> coke-headed <laughs> directors of all time. Of all um, time ever. Yeah, it, I really recommend anybody who who is interested in in Hollywood history and things like that. You read uh, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. Um, it's about this era about of filmmaking, and uh, there's a ch an entire chapter on The Exorcist where <laughs> you learn that William Friedkin uh, is certainly a flawed person. Really? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I gotta <laughs> read this, dude. What's it called again? 
Uh, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. I gotta, uh, hear, it's, I gotta uh, read this. It's Peter Biskine, I think, is his name. The it's great. I mean, uh, it'll really give you like a, a great idea of like, uh, you know, what was going on between like Scorsese and Coppola mm -hmm. and all these major guys of the time, and you Grand also Brady realize Brady. just how uh, homogenous Hollywood wow. was then and still kind of is. But I mean, I say kind of is. It is. I I I am a white male. I, I don't get to really <laughs> comment on how hard it is for minorities to uh, make it in Hollywood. But uh, in the 70s, it was just pure cocaine-fueled madness. Wow. And um, Friedkin is interesting specifically because he tried he, – he decided, like, to move away from the art movie. Like, he – with with The Exorcist um, – he was trying to do something more stripped down like he had done with the French connection two years before. And I think he does. I think, I think, you know, as we go along, we'll see like, this is a, even though it's a long movie and there are a lot of scenes and like a lot of different like points, uh, that, that are like, they seem like there's no way you could cut one of them out, even though it's like, long and drawn out it seems like yeah. everything is is necessary and and he doesn't doesn't take a lot of risks with the shots the shots are all kind of simple most of the time but, yeah uh it, it actually ends up being amazing it's because, almost kind of tolkien-esque isn't it like when you read like yeah. the lord of the rings trilogy and you're like wow this is uh this definitely could have used some some editing but then when you look yes. back on it you're like it was kind of neat how it all really played everything out for me, you know. Yeah, yeah, like it. Yeah, the, it's it's real hard. I'm not a Tolkien fan uh, as far as reading. Yeah, I love oh, yeah. love Lord of the Rings, but uh, reading him is is a a slog for sure. I assume that this is not the first time that you've seen this movie, correct? It is not. I saw this movie as a Ute. Um, a Ute. I, yeah, Ute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I. I saw this as a youth, and I was bored by it. I thought it was too long. Mm -hmm. The opening seemed to me to last forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, when you say it, youth, how how youthful are we talking? I uh, I believe I was twelve or thirteen when I saw The Exorcist. Wow. Um, wow. And I also I didn't grow up religious. Uh, I grew up my, myself not really believing in a god. My my family never really went to church. Um, uh -huh. And so demons never really scared me. And the yeah. idea of possession didn't really scare me as a child. Um, I still am not scared of demons. or But the idea of possession is something that um, is very frightening to me. I think, you know, when you talk about things like dementia or, or mm -hmm. things like, uh, you know, people with uh, schizophrenia, et cetera, where it's like you you suddenly don't have control of your own body and your brain's yeah. not exactly in control. That frightens the shit out of me. <laughs> so. That's not a, that's not anywhere you want to be. No. Um, how about you? This is your first time seeing this. So this is the first time that I've seen this. For those of you guys who um, maybe haven't listened to our podcast before, let's say with a big name title like The Exorcist, this might be the first time a lot of people listen to this yeah. program. This program. <laughs> <laughs> this program. Um, I I am a uh, I'm a recovering sheltered homeschooler, and uh, <laughs> as a young person, I wasn't allowed to watch any horror movies. So I kind of I kind of came into horror flicks later on in life because it was kind of the forbidden fruit for me. It was taboo. Mm. So of course, yeah. as soon as I started getting out of the house, that's the first thing that I wanted to see was horror movies. And um, The Exorcist, you know, even even though for like the past I don't know ten years or something like this, I've been watching a lot of horror flicks especially over the past maybe five years or so, um, I've never watched The Exorcist. It's kind of been like the, you know, the the lofty height of Mount Horror Olympus. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, you know, anytime you look up best horror movies ever, of course, yeah, it's, it's, it's always there. there. It's always there, yeah. you know? And, and it, it, it should be, honestly. I mean, now, after having watched it as an adult, yeah. I agree, it should be up there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, it, it is like... I guess, like, seriously, Dario Argento was this for me. It's just, 
if if you haven't seen it and you've heard so much about it, you've heard so much about how scary it is, etc. It's almost like, well, this can only be a disappointment. Yes, that that's really how I felt it was going to be going into it. I was like, yeah, yeah this is going to be kind of because you know, it's like whenever I saw Halloween for the first time, it's like I'd always heard, you know, yeah. oh, this is one of the most classic scary movies of all time. Yeah, and I, I watched Halloween and I loved it. Halloween, the original, is one of my all time favorite movies, but I was never really scared per se. No. No, it, yeah, I think a lot of these older horror movies, um, they were scary because people weren't yet desensitized to a lot of this stuff. Um, though, to be honest, The Shining, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, those are, those are movies that retain their creepiness and, and terrifying. Well, because those are horror movies made by talented ass directors, not just packs with a shoestring yeah. budget but you and, know? and the thing though i would say about this movie the exorcist is that um and, and i think you posted this on facebook maybe around the time you were watching it that it's so sacrilegious yeah. like it's so like oh my God. It, it goes out there it goes balls out sacrilegious that i would say you know even as someone who is completely desensitized to sacrilege uh, there are a couple scenes where I was like, "Oh wow, like <laughs> that that'll probably get under some people's skin right there." And then and then you also go, "And this was made like forty yeah. years ago." Jesus. And dude, like the whole time that I was watching this movie, I was thinking like, it's the same stuff that I think about when I think about, which is funny because it's really the same yeah. time period. I think about whenever Black Sabbath came out, like that first Black Sabbath record came out in nineteen seventy. And in 1969, one year prior to that, you had every hippy-dippy love child at Woodstock. And then one year later, you were hearing, like, the song Black Sabbath, which is still just, like, fucking yeah. terrifying. And then, like, you know, War Pigs and all this stuff like this. And it's like, people must have felt like, at that time, they must have thought they were just listening to a soundtrack of, you know, a portal to hell. <laughs> yes. And that's how I feel about this movie, too. Like, I cannot imagine that long ago seeing this. Because there's, there's honestly stuff in this flick that, even now, in 2017, is hard to yeah. deal with. Um, so, back then, I can only imagine how hysterical and how flabbergasted people must have been. I watched a couple of documentaries on YouTube. There's a couple you can find about the public reaction in 1973, I guess a couple of news channels and stuff ran stories about the reactions people were having to this movie. And dude, it's like these theaters all across America, people were waiting like five and six hours in line to yeah. see this movie. And then like passing out within the first 30 minutes or having to go into the lobby and throw up and just all of this stuff. Like people absolutely couldn't mm. handle it. Yeah. Um, what had been released prior to this that was this fucked up, dude? Like even well, that's remotely, what I was gonna say. Um, the I would say that I mean, yeah, there are a lot of there were a lot of B movies around this time, or sure. uh, like you know, late night horror flick type of things that it, that probably would have been. But we're uh, talking like considered... Creature from the Black Lagoon, fucking like cheesy schlocky yeah. rubber suit movies. But not, yeah, not I would fucking say possession movies. I would say uh, Night of the Living Dead would be close yeah. uh, because. Uh, people forget Night of the Living Dead. If you haven't watched it in a long it's a time, damn you need black to watch and white. It. It's old as hell. It's so old, and Night of the Living Dead is so brutal. I mean, a, a little it girl is. kills her mom in a basement in that in that movie. <laughs> like, Lest we forget. <laughs> yeah, like that. It's insane. Um, and so yeah, like, but this was this was huge budget. Night of the Living Dead was 68, I believe. Wow. And it was made on a shoestring budget in Pittsburgh. Wow. This is huge budget. And the reason why this got made is because of William Blatty's novel, The Exorcist, which sold 13 million copies in Jeez. 71. Have you read the book? I have not. I want to now. Yeah. Um. I, I mean, Blatty was the one who adapted the screenplay. Sure. And f from reading the um, the synopsis of the book, I think a huge portion of the story of the book made it into the movie. But okay. a lot gets cut out because 
it, he went into a lot of detail. He did a lot of research on exorcism and stuff like that. I watched and some actually, interviews with him. Yeah, and he did a lot of in-depth case yeah. researches of, of exorcisms and stuff like this. I understand in the book there's a lot more information about, like, the help that lives in the house and stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. We'll like, the guy was a Nazi sure. or something? Yes. The he fuck? was. Um, and he, he in reality, was, too. What? Uh, I... I cannot say with a surety because I, I did a bunch of research on that guy trying to find out was he a Nazi. He had to have been. He was a working actor in Germany throughout the 30s and 40s. He worked Whoa. a lot. So there's no way he wasn't a Nazi. He was, he was in a, a part propaganda of the film or two or something. Yeah, he was in a lot of propaganda films. He was he was in one of the biggest propaganda films, but he was also in a film that was banned by the Nazis. So, uh yeah, I don't know. And, and I wouldn't accuse this man or, or his family of, of having been a Nazi or Nazi sympathizer. I couldn't find any definite information on it. But if you were a working actor in the 30s and 40s in Berlin, you were a part of the party. Like, that. that's just it. Like, yeah. yeah. You weren't getting a job if you were like, fuck the Nazis. Not necessarily um, you supported the views and so forth, but, you know. Yeah. Wow. Um, We should talk about the fact that Blatty worked – for the Air Force's Psychological Warfare Division. What? Uh, yeah. Blatty worked for Psychological Warfare Division, and people have said that the flashes of the demon's face... Yeah, the are subliminal like, you know, shit. Yeah, they're like a subliminal thing. And, and Blatty has said before, if you can see it, it's not subliminal. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So Holy it, shit. He, he knew what he was doing. I had but, no idea. That's why this shit is so effective. Yes. Yes. Wow. It is. Um, also, uh, Blatty won an Academy Award for the screenplay. This this movie is the first horror film ever nominated for Best Picture. Uh, ten Academy Award nominations. Good God! It won. It won two: Best Sound Mixing and Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, wow. Th this movie brought horror films into the mainstream. And in fact, this movie was, uh, it is currently adjusted for inflation, the 12th um, highest grossing film. Good single God. film. Yeah. Uh, adjusted for inflation is $1.794 billion they Holy made. Holy shit. That's like Avengers um, dollars. Yes. <laughs> um, it held the record for highest grossing horror movie for all of a year and a half because then Jaws came out. Oh, wow. This movie made Jaws possible, though. I'm saying this right. for a surety. This movie, without this movie, uh, the, people would not have been lined up around the block for Jaws. Sure. People, they, they saw uh, The Exorcist and they saw that a horror movie could be something like a, a story it could right. be a movie like a real movie and and they just lined up around the block for jaws that's fucking amazing and can you imagine too like how pissed people must have been to see such a an out and out sacrilegious movie be nominated <laughs> for be rewarded for being the way it is like people must have yeah. been pissed as hell this is one of those movies that i was always i was always warned about Again, I grew up very, very religious and stuff like this. Yeah. And I was always basically told, kind of like what I've been saying, that this movie was just basically a portal to hell. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know what? It's one of those that, like, knowing how I was as a as a kid and stuff, I'm actually really glad I was sheltered from this movie as a kid. I think that if I would have uh -huh. seen this movie as a child, it probably would have like ruined Scarred my childhood. You? Yeah. Yeah. It does a, a lot of people have told me that. A lot of people have said that the Exorcist really fucked them up and they don't yeah. like horror movies because of it. So <laughs> I totally believe it. I mean I mean really yeah. like it's the kind of thing that kinda of like what I was saying about Halloween earlier. Like whenever I saw that I was like, Please, you're trying to keep this from me. This is no big deal. It's not a big deal at all. You know, this is totally yeah. fake. It's not real. I'm totally glad if 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 <laughs> if Lee Weber Hustad, formerly Eller, is listening to this. I'll say, Ma, <laughs> good on you. Good on you for keeping me away from this one. It would have led to many a sleepless night and confused feeling. Uh, I'm glad I didn't see this as a kid. And and let me say to your mother, 
Uh, thank you for raising such a, a beautiful young man. Steve. Uh, he's deep in my heart. Uh, oh. He's my boyfriend. Oh, Steve. Oh, wait. oh shit. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, like, um, this movie is, is, it's, it's well known for one thing in particular, and that is Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells. Yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, and the, the music score. in this movie is, I, I, I don't know if we've done a movie so far that has had bad music. No. Um, this one definitely play, like great tone. Yep. Uh, never it never steps in too much. Like you never, you don't really think much about the music. It just sort of like when you hear it again, you're you're taken back to the moment. Like you're like, oh god, yeah, right. That that's what was happening in the movie while that was playing. It's kind of like kind of like the Halloween soundtrack stuff like that. Yeah. It, it, the mm-hmm. minute you hear it, it does it does take you back and give you a feeling. There's a lot of scenes in this too that don't have soundtrack, which is something I have in my, yes. in my disheveled, drunken notes. I have a bunch of things that say <laughs> no soundtrack, and it's really cool because it lets you just be in that scene and in that moment. Um, it was really it was really cool to watch this. I'm so 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 stoked that I finally saw yeah. it and. I feel like I saw it at a good time too, you know, where we're doing this podcast and where I'm really forced to kind of think deeper about yeah. these movies than I probably would have if I was just watching them, watching oh, them. Yeah. You know? So it's fun. It's great. Well, let's kind of you want to you want to go into this thing and break it up. Yeah. Well, the opening of the movie there, we have some. This was kind of unexpected for me. I had no idea that anything in this movie took place in uh, the, the yeah. Middle East. It opens up. Yeah. With this. Arabic chanting and the sun over the yeah, desert. The, so you, you get the Muslim call to prayer. Yeah, yeah. It's automatically like uh, alienating if you're an American, especially yeah. this time in the the 70s. This was the beginning of the rise of like the Middle East uh, issues with the Americans, and so like yeah, it is immediately like, oh, what's going on? And so then we get this this old fella who's digging through some ruins of a temple as part of a, an excavation team, and he finds something. The The name of that site, I just wanted to mention, yeah. uh, is Hatra. The, Hatra is extremely important uh, city um, because it was, a, it was sort of a, a nexus of all these different cultures and religions that came mm. together, and there was always a tenuous tolerance there. Um, and so... Uh, the the fact that uh, what he does find here we'll talk about in a second uh, is is two separate um, idols basically mm. uh, one is Christian and one is uh, Babylonian or I, I think it was Akkadian first but Babylonian um, the the fact that they find those things there is because this was like a this big nexus of religions and because of that. Uh, those I- assholes. I'm. A, I'm gonna. I've already said shit about the alt right and Bloods and Crips. Now I'm gonna go ahead and say <laughs> fuck ISIS. ISIS. Des- ISIS destroyed Hatra in 2015. Oh, they destroyed it. So the it. this movie actually has extreme important cultural and archaeological relevance just because it shows Hatra because Hatra doesn't exist anymore. Holy shit. It's like seeing a movie where it shows like the Twin Towers and you're like, and those yeah. don't exist anymore. Yeah, not there anymore. <laughs> anyway, Thanks, so yeah, they find um, the guy The guy is Father Lancaster Marin. They find two things. One thing they find is a St. Joseph pendant. Okay, I was and, wondering what that was. I'm glad you clarified okay. that. I wasn't, okay. I wasn't and, certain and what that was. And the other thing they find is a um, a Pazuzu. Uh, it, it, Big he statue. was a Babylonian. Uh, people say demon, but in Babylonian religion, that doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no such thing as a demon. Uh, right. But Pazuzu, it has like this dog face and wings, and it's a scary looking idol. Huge dong. Right? Big old dong. Now, I this I, I I'm gonna say far too much context right now, uh, but th- I think it's important for throughout the movie. Saint Joseph in the Catholic Church is yeah. associated with protecting unborn children, okay, um, and and further with just protection of children. He's also a part of the um, the exorcist 
uh, manual, like the 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 prayer they say, they invoke Saint Joseph. Pazuzu, wow. the uh, Babylonian deity, Pazuzu, also was a protector of unborn children. And he was also so, the god of the desert and the winds and so forth too. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I read a so, thing that said that like very very similar to the way that you know gargoyles are hung up outside of churches to ward off lesser mm-hmm. demons that yeah people back then would put a statue of Pazuzu in the window to ward off you know other mischievous yeah. demons that might interfere in the household and so forth so here's the thing this is i i want to throughout be looking at this yeah because in the sequels the demon is specifically named as Pazuzu Mm-hmm. In this, it never uh, no. is the demon named Pazuzu. And in fact, when we see flashes of the demon, the demon is nothing like uh, Pazuzu. It's nothing like the statue. The The thing is that Pazuzu protected um, babies from a female deity. So I don't think that the intention in this first movie was for Pazuzu to be the demon. I think it is... Uh, like a, a a way of showing the counter to the Catholic protector of unborn children. Well, there's also this protector of unborn children, and uh, both, I guess, could be said to be fighting uh, whatever is trying to possess Reagan. Now, I know okay. that's not how anybody else sees this movie, but Dude, I'm, I'm telling almost you. positive that Pazuzu is part of the protection in this movie and not the demon. With that being said, we are going to have some very, very fun discussions about possibility yeah. of what the fuck's happening in this movie. Yeah, I've, I've, had, I've, God, had a lot, yes. I've had a lot of thoughts about this over the past day awesome. or two. And uh, yeah, this is going to be really fun to talk about because I'm telling you, dude, I have so many fucking crazy ideas about what's going on in this movie. <laughs> we'll get to that later. So he sees the dog face statue again after that, and there's like there's some dogs fighting. And the sun yeah. sets, and then we cut to Georgetown, which is where we get um, the mother, Chris, yeah. as she's known as. Which, Ellen Burstyn. Yeah, I have a quick Ellen Burstyn so story. Movies. I've seen her in so many movies as like a, a, a yeah. beautiful old lady. She's great. And then I didn't know she was in this. I had no idea she was in this. She's aged extremely well. Uh, she looks so great. I um, actually I went to a taping of CBS's mom. Uh, oh, which is a show I have actually never seen except for the taping I went to. Uh-huh. Ellen Burstyn was a guest star on that episode. Oh shit! Um, and she was adorable. Oh, um, very nice, sweet lady. She waved to the audience. It was very nice and funny. Um, That's cool. My Ellen Burstyn story. Oh, and also, uh, she we became best friends after that. You know, stuff like that. She just calls me all the time. Hey, Stephen, what's up? <laughs> if I could put something out there about. Uh, old Marin that we saw a scene earlier there. Uh huh. Lancaster Marin. I just learned this actually uh, earlier yeah. to I earlier know what you're today. About to say. Yeah. How fucking old did you think he was when you watched this movie? He he looks seventy. He looks he looks old. He looks fucking old, and he was like fucking forty when this was filmed. Like he was forty four or it's something like this. Max he, He's forty. The makeup that they use to make him look old is so good. It's unreal. It's it's fucking crazy. Like I never once, never once in this movie went, oh, it's just a guy in old people makeup. Like even when you watch <laughs> no. like fucking fucking bad grandpa, you go, oh, that's Johnny Knoxville in old man makeup. Yeah. Like, there's a point where you know you don't know this whole fucking movie that that's actually like a middle aged guy looking really old. Which, in turn, makes me so fucking mad at Prometheus. My God. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Why the fuck? I can't believe you brought up Prometheus just now, but yes. (laughs) That's Uh. just the first place my mind went. I'm like, when old man makeup can be that good, why do you have to have that fucking CGI'd fake old guy in that movie? Fuck me. Fucking, what's it, Wayland in that movie is fake old with CGI? It's bullshit. It's so bad, and and obviously, like, uh, what I read was he uh, he actually had to spend more time in makeup than Linda Blair did. Holy so, shit! Yeah, so they were dedicated to making him look old, but 
they did it so well. Like they, they it's incredible. I think they used the natural contouring of his face yeah. instead of doing what they do a lot, which is they add like you know uh, some prosthetic Prosthetics. and then they and they blend it in, etc. Like, yeah, it, he it looks so good. Wow, that's incredible. I just that blew my mind whenever I heard that earlier because I never once this whole movie thought that's actually a middle aged guy. He's not really that old. So we cut to Georgetown and we see the mother, right. Ellen uh, Burstyn, Chris. Right. Um, Chris, and she's she's like making notes on a script and she has a an unlit cigarette. This is a thing that they never talk about, but I think is perfect. Friedkin uh, made a great choice to not yeah. have them ever mention it, but she's apparently trying to quit smoking. Yeah, like hiding it or something, mm-hmm. right? Well, yeah, she just always has an unlit cigarette with her. Um, and, and she hears a she hears a noise in the attic, which yeah. this is this is an interesting point that plays into what I have to say later. She hears a noise in the attic, and then she goes and checks on her daughter, uh, Linda Blair, aka in this movie Reagan. Mm-hmm. And, oh God, uh, we have to talk about that anyway. Yeah, <laughs> we got to talk about why her name is Reagan. We have to like this. This would be like in. Uh, in 2008 naming uh, a character Romney it, yes like Reagan had just run for president and he ran again not long after this like yeah he was big yeah um <laughs> so dude and this it, so ties him to something I have to say later um and so in the in the morning Chris tells the it, it looks like they have sort of some live in help uh in yeah. the house there's like a man servant and a female servant uh-huh and she tells the help. And she's like, "Oh, I think there's there's rats in the attic." And then we move on to a movie set where they're filming. It looks like a movie about a college protest or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And we see a, the priest in the crowd too. Yeah, and this shot was interesting to me because it's it's a tracking shot of Karis, uh, uh, the character who I ar- I would argue is the protagonist of the movie. I mean, we can get into that, but. Um, you, it's following Karis, but you don't know it immediately. Like, if you don't know that Karis is one of the characters in the movie, like, it, it just looks so like it's extra. just panning across a bunch of students, and then Karis goes a different way, and the camera follows him. So it's like this really effective way of uh, separating him out of the crowd. Yeah, very um, much so. But, but very not great. It super like, obvious. The night when uh, Chris goes in the first night and, and checks on Reagan, uh, her window's open. And this is a thing that will keep coming back. The windows keep getting opened. We see we see her just joking around having fun with her mom. This sets the baseline so we know that some of her behavior starts to escalate to a little more difficult um, as, as it leads up to us finding out what's going on with her. Um, right. And then we get the scene of the priest. I think it's... Uh... You call him Karis. I guess in my notes I've called him Damien. Is that correct? Yeah, Damien Karis. That's his name. Yeah. Um, we, okay, we got to talk about this too. Damien, first off, uh, is a name that people generally associate with evil because yeah. of The Omen. Yes, which um, is one of my all-time faves. Yeah, The Omen came out before this. And now we were talking about this. The Omen is, is maybe one of those movies that set up the possibility for this level of sacrilege. The Omen, the main character, is... Damien, oh, and the Antichrist. The decision to name either character Damien is interesting, but it, it's also interesting. Damien Karras is Greek. He's very Greek. Like, right. uh, I, when we see his mom later, I'm pretty sure she's just some phyllo dough and some spinach. Like, <laughs> um, they're so Greek. I looked it up. 98% of Greece right now is Greek Orthodox. Wow. In the that's, 70s, that's and, and when they moved to America, every Greek person would have been Greek Orthodox. So why the hell are they Catholic? Wow, that's I, fucked up. I'm very interested in this choice, and I know it's not an accident. I know that Blatty didn't just yeah. go like, oh, we'll just make, we'll just make him Greek. I think huh. maybe the reason is that the association with uh, the Vatican, the association with the church is anti-science or maybe anti-logic and Damien Karras is a very logical uh, scientific yeah. like evidence based person Definitely, uh, as we see so it's weird movie. it's weird that he's a priest but he is a psychiatrist priest like yeah. he 
he serves as a psychiatrist for other priests, and it's really burning him out. So. He goes into his tiny little fucking dirtbag apartment where he lives with his uh-huh. ancient old Philo Doe grandmother. Uh-huh. <laughs> she's... Oh, it's his mom. She's oh uh, uh, yeah, mom. That's she's right. super sweet. Uh, she she's loving. She dotes on him. She's um, feeble. He's having a crisis of faith. Uh, like that's I I think what the story really shows us is this priest sure. who's so logical minded minded having a crisis of faith and finally turning to his faith in the end. Um, but his relationship with his mother is. Uh, the thing that really sets him off, and this is interesting, if you read Easy Riders or Hitching Bulls, read the chapter on The Exorcist, and and Blatty and Friedkin both have some major mom issues. So Wow. Like, yeah, so th- this was, for them, this was very important, that th- Karis's relationship with his mother be, like, a, a central element uh, to the, the whole character. Now, in the next scene in my notes... You'll have to refresh my memory about what I saw here, Steve. I have Reagan makes statue. What am I talking about? Uh, she, Re- okay, so they're in the basement, and Reagan is uh, she's playing around with some paper mache, and her mom finds a Ouija board. Now, right. <laughs> as we all know, Hasbro brought down the the hammer of Satan on us when they started releasing Ouija boards. Clearly, because. The moment you touch one, everything goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's um, all so she says that she talks to a guy named Captain Howdy. Captain Howdy. Now, either uh, there is a demon child molester, or uh, someone who used to present a children's program died in that house. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's either a child molester or a children's program performer. Captain Howdy. Answer. So yeah, they uh, she she doesn't seem to respond negatively to this. And then we get um, Ra- Reagan and Zen bed, and she's talking about her her birthday plans and how they're gonna have a party. And Reagan's like, "Oh, you should bring Burke. That's the director of the movie that her mother Chris is in." Yeah. Here's another thing in my notes that I don't understand. I have a note that says she's not gonna marry pizza, just friends. What the fuck is that? Huh? <laughs> I don't know for sure. <laughs> She's not I gonna marry not pizza. Positive. Just friends. Um, <laughs> that's called tequila night. <laughs> Earlier in the first scene where we first saw Reagan, she mentions in the uh, park when she was walking with uh, Chris's assistant that they saw a beautiful gray gelding uh, horse. This this is important. Um, this is this is a reference to Revelation, uh, chapter six, verse eight. And I looked and beheld uh, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with it. Whoa! Yeah, uh, a gray horse or a pale horse. It says here, pale in this sense. The Greek word is translated as gray. So she she sees a gray horse, and. This is the first indication, like that something big is is really happening. That's when we cut um, to the priest at the bar. Like Damien is yes. there with Tom, and um, and that's yeah. too that's and, too when you start getting the impression that it's like okay, these are priests at a bar talking and drinking. They're not exactly super super you know uh, uptight. I guess you would say they're. I mean, no, they're, yeah. they're having a drink. At a fucking yeah. bar, and Damien is talking about how he. It doesn't really give you a ton of detail. He's just like, "I want out. I've lost. I've lost my faith." He's like, "I just. I'm not feeling this." Um, it, it is interesting to note that the guy who plays Tom is also the actual Jesuit priest who taught William Blatty at Brooklyn Prep School, and then again at Georgetown. Wow. So, um, in fact, uh, two of the priests in this movie are played by actual priests. Tom and uh, the other more popular one. I can't remember his name offhand. It's pretty uh, interesting one- seeing too that like how many people condemned this movie and it's like it had actual priests in it. Yeah, that's actually uh, was one of the things that made the people upset was uh, the treatment oh, right. of the priests in the movie because there are actual priests and not just actors. 
Um, people didn't like the fact that, uh, you know, maybe uh, William Friedkin wasn't uh, the nicest director. He, uh, in the scene at the end where Karis is dying and his friend comes up to give him last rites, uh, that, the guy, his friend, is an actual priest, not an actor, though right. he does a great job in the movie. Uh, Friedkin uh, wasn't getting the emotional response out of him that he wanted, so he said to him, do you trust me? And he said, of course I do, Billy. And uh, uh, Friedkin smacked him and then said, action. There's, <laughs> so, dude, like, there's apparently a lot of fucked up shit like this through this whole yeah. movie where, like, actors weren't really told what was going to happen on on the scene. They're like, oh, we're just putting you in this harness here. Uh, and then some, you're going to get you know pulled halfway across the room, but you don't know that yet. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. They fucked up Ellen Burstyn's coccyx. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he, you know, and this, again, this is the 70s era of filmmaking. The it's director a wild was west, God, really. So. Yeah. Well, and you know, yeah. that, that's very that's very much like the, you know, the super famous scene in, in Alien with the, the first chest, chest burster that you see. Like, yeah. the reactions that you see from the actors on screen, the reason that they're so incredible and why everybody seems so flabbergasted is because they didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that... Listen, I think that is an absolute necessity in filmmaking. I, and I, I do awesome. think that there, there are boundaries and borders that just have to be demolished when you're making a film or television. When you're making anything creative, you got, you've got you got to be willing to go to extremes. Right. Um, and, and certainly there have been people who have gone to ex like extremes that are just out there. I mean, the way that, uh, the way that Kubrick treated uh Shelley. what's her name in the shining yeah uh, it's just deplorable if you read about it like he made her do that uh the scene going backwards up the stairs with a baseball bat oh, yeah. like 40 something times oh it was and more then, than that it was a couple hundred it was over 100. yeah was and then when she got it the way he wanted it he said all right put film in the camera so he no was way. fucking with her the whole time just to get that exhausted, like absolute, like drained of all energy feeling out of her. Yeah. And he did it, but God. <laughs> Damn it. Director. It cuts to the next scene and there's a wake up call for um Chris and she wakes up and Reagan is in bed sleeping with her. She said because her bed was shaking. Yeah. Um, yeah, Reagan's like my bed was shaking, I couldn't sleep. Yeah. There's a noise and, in the attic. Yeah, and so Chris, again, she goes up, she hears the noise in the attic, so she goes up to check it out. Uh, the lights are out. Obviously, it's an attic. Never any lights on in attics. Uh, she takes a candle, and she's walking, and then suddenly the flame of the candle gets really big, uh, and it scares Chris, and then Carl, the German servant, shows up to gloat about the fact that there are no rats in the traps. I find it very interesting Um People would certainly say that this movie has a complicated relationship with women. Um, I find it very interesting how dismissive everyone is of Chris all the time. Like everything she says. Oh God! Uh, especially the doctors. The male it's just doctors like yeah, and nobody's yeah, listening we're... to her. Um, and uh, I, I think the only person that seems to be willing to listen to her is Burke, who uh, you know. Seems to be a pretty good friend, but we don't get a whole lot of that in the movie. Uh, it seems like everybody, though, just sort of dismisses her immediately. Yeah. I, and I don't think it's because of her. Uh, personally, I think it's just a dismissive attitude toward women generally throughout this movie. The, then we cut to the church, and this is, okay. You know, because, so because pop culture. Insane. I feel like there's so many things in this movie that I kind of already knew about. Like, I wasn't shocked when her head spun around. I wasn't shocked right, when she yeah. threw up pea soup. It's like, those are all things I knew yeah. Yeah, everybody just from knows pop about culture. Uh, I had no idea this was in here. Yeah. Uh, this, is one of the, well, this is one of those things in this movie where I was like, wait, what in the fuck did I just see? Because there's priests delivering some flowers and stuff in there. And yeah. then we see, he looks all disturbed and it shows what he's looking at. And it's a statue of the Virgin Mary that has these huge, elongated, distorted, like, cone tits. And, and a like, dick. a spike. Yeah, okay, yeah, and, like, a dick. And a it's like, spiked dick. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, made out of paper mache, and it's painted orange. Holy so, fuck, is that what that is? Uh, yeah. 
So the Reagan did oh. this. Reagan did this in the night. Her bed was shaking. She went and slept with her mom. So at some point in the night, she went and did this. I did um, not. I did not pick up on that. That was yeah. The paper mache, but it's like yeah, it's all kind of lumpy and cruddy looking like paper mache does. Yeah. Like I had not seen this image, and the camera just kind of sits on it for a second, lets you get a oh, real yeah. good look, and it's, yeah, I took a screenshot of it because uh, I it has to go up on our Twitter when we're yeah. talking about this because it it's demented. Like it, it it doesn't bother me. Like it doesn't bother me that a statue has been uh, defaced. Yeah. But I know what it's supposed to mean. And yeah. The interesting <laughs> think about this. Uh this it's a fringe theory that has existed since I would say the the early 20th century and the understanding of uh you know the way that genetics work and thing. It's been a fringe theory that perhaps um Mary was some sort of hermaphrodite. Uh, and that yeah, and that uh the uh her giving birth to a child without having had sex is just parthenogenesis which is something that happens in uh you know simpler animals yeah so this is this is in some way a reference to that she has she has put breasts on uh as an indication of like the maternal and a dick on as an indication of the paternal uh which is uh, also a denial that jesus is the son of god uh so the the shocking image of it is already enough, but the implications of it are like real deeply sacrilegious. Holy shit. I hadn't thought about any of that. <laughs> um, God damn. That's, that's really super jacked. And like the fact that I, as far as I know, I haven't seen that on like the back cover of any black metal album is very surprising. <laughs> that is surprising. I would think that would have happened long ago. But you know that's the thing. That's sort of this is sort of further reinforcing something that we've seen throughout this movie, and we continue to see. Um, that I think is a huge theme throughout this thing. So the first time that we saw the Pazuzu statue, it had this huge like snake dick. It had this huge yeah. coiled up dick, and then yeah. we see the the Mary statue with like, you know, tits and a dick, and then there's yeah. all the extremely crude sexual stuff. That oh, Reagan yeah. says throughout the movie later on, there's this huge sexual theme through the movie. Yeah, and that, and that has to do with the theme of the the possession being uh, puberty. Like she's she's going through puberty. I mean, right. she's suddenly emitting a lot of different fluids from her orifices. She's suddenly more sexual. Wow, she's uh, yeah. harder to control. Etc. And I yeah. think this is interesting because Linda Blair, um, who hasn't, I mean, her career hasn't been amazing after this, but Linda Blair beat out a lot of, uh, a lot of names you would know to get this part. She, sure. Uh, Sharon Stone, Jamie Lee Curtis, Brooke wow. Shields, Kim Basinger, Laura Dern, Melanie Griffith, they were all considered for the role. Carrie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds were considered. They were going to have Carrie shit. Fisher play. Reagan and and Debbie Reynolds play Chris. Whoa. Uh, And and it it all comes down to they they thought Linda Blair was perfect for this. And I think they're right because she um, she has such a natural sort of innocence that comes across that makes the things that she ends up saying seem even more demented. Oh, absolutely so, man. At the party, uh, Burke says... He says something about finding a pubic hair in his drink. Yeah, I have that in my notes. It says director finds pubic drink. Okay. He calls it an a- he calls it an alien pubic hair, which was interesting. Like normally he has pubic say. hairs in his drink, but he knows where they come from. Yeah. <laughs> and so then Chris um, is asking about that uh, about Damien, and uh, Bert calls the Bert calls the help dude a Nazi, and they have a little scuffle, and he's ushered oh, out. Oh man. I love this. He call he calls him a, a cunting hun, and uh, a damn dirty Nazi pig or something. Yeah, yeah he and a, a, lets a bit of a scuffle him. ensues. This is interesting to me. It's not something that's followed up on in the movie, but Burke dies in this movie. 
by yeah. uh, his his neck is broken. He's found at the bottom of the iconic stairs from The Exorcist, yeah. uh, which uh, look treacherous as hell. And I can't imagine why in the hell you would have stairs like that in a city where you get like <laughs> you get freezing weather. Like, god damn, I would never go down those stairs. No, never. Um, but they never mention this as a possibility. But is it possible that Carl killed Burke? Oh, damn. Because we don't see Burke die. No. That's uh-uh. not even like... like We don't even get the context of Burke dying in this movie. Uh, so, like, I don't know. I, I think that's something to definitely I'd like to consider. read in the book if they, if they outline that more. And so, so the director leaves, and then everybody's having a good time after he leaves, and everybody's kind of singing some songs around the old piano there. And Reagan, who was asleep, she comes downstairs in her nightgown, and yeah, she, she says, looks dazed. Yeah, and she's everybody kind of stops what they're doing and looks at her, and she says, "You're gonna die up there." And then yeah, pees to in an the astronaut. Floor. Yeah, he's pees in, wait to an astronaut. Yeah, that guy's an astronaut. What? Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's just brief. Um, the the popular I cannot remember Father Dyer. That's his name. The popular guy. He's like talking to him, and he's you know talking about going up into space. And so when Reagan says that to him, she's saying like, "You're gonna go to space and die." Um, yeah. <laughs> and then she, like, pees in the floor. Yeah, it's just pees. Um, and, again, uh, uh, seriously, a, a child with a fever could easily Do weird stuff, uh, yeah. say some weird shit and, and pee on the floor. And, it's yeah. it, again, it's not, it's not cause to jump to possession, for sure. And uh, later on in the night, Reagan screams for mom, for Chris, and she, uh, Chris goes in there, and the bed is, like, rocking and going fucking crazy. And it looks very, it, dude, that effect when the bed is rocking and stuff, and indeed, really, every visual effect in this movie is so convincing uh-huh. because it's fucking real and yeah. not CGI. Dude, the whole time I was watching this movie, in so many scenes, I just kept thinking to myself, wow, if this movie was made now... This would have the most fucking dramatic, like, fucking 16 cuts in one second. And yeah. creepy camera angles. And, you know, like, every horror movie film now has, like, that nasty, <laughs> like, blue-green, bluish-brownish hue. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's Everything so would look fucking stupid. It's like, real life doesn't look like that, so it's not fucking scary. That's the thing, that's the thing about, like, this movie and, like, The Omen and Rosemary's Baby and The Shining. Yeah. Real life looks like that. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Real life looks like Naturalism. that. Naturalism, yeah. I want I want it to look as natural as possible. In fact, like uh, the lighting of Texas Chainsaw Massacre is like that. It's one of the things that creates the the yeah, atmosphere because it's the and most it's harsh, natural. unflattering natural lighting ever. Yeah. Like man, like if you watch like the Elm Street remake, it's like what fucking universe does that take place in that light looks like that? It's bullshit. Fucking horrible. So then after that, we get Damien and is it the college, uh, the, the church like yeah. president guy and they're, they're in, they're in like his dorm room and they're smoking and drinking a stolen bottle of Shivas Regal, Regal, uh, the seventies were fucking gross, Ben. In this scene, Dyer helps Karis take off his shoes and he's wearing leather shoes without socks, Ben. Leather shoes without socks. It's going to smell so bad. What? Like what the hell were we doing in the 70s that we were just like, ah, I don't mind that every place smells like cigarettes and Formica. Like, ugh. And, and fucking sweaty leather. And sweaty leather. Um, and he's smoking in bed, which is so gross to me for some reason. I, I mean, I think I, I think cigarettes are gross anyway, but like, I hate it. smoking in bed to me, it seems like your bed's going to smell like cigarettes. You just think Why it's like, you, that, that's ooh. just a move that you make when you've given up on life, I guess. Yeah, you're just like, now, fuck it. Here's another line just... I need you to explain to me. Because in my notes, I have dream, metal from earlier, ma, Pazuzu. Uh-huh. Tell me yeah, what I'm I talking the, about. I actually wrote down all the images of the dream. Uh, the first thing he sees is that St. Joseph pendant. Okay, so he Father sees the metal Marin was inspecting. from Marin. Yeah. Right? Okay. And then he sees the black dog barking. Uh, he sees his mother crying in the darkness. The black dog, a, a traditional symbol yeah. of death and, of and the doom. devil and, and death yeah like uh, yeah black black any creature is always a negative yeah. symbol yeah. um and we see a clock pendulum 
uh, his mother's walking up from a metro stop in New York, and then we see him. He's standing out on like a median, and he's he's yelling for her, but like she she doesn't seem to see him, and and then she turns back around and goes in. He sees the demon face in the dream. That's the which first time we've a, seen it. Yeah, yeah. I think this is the first flash of it. Um, and the demon face is actually Linda Blair's stunt double painted up. I heard that um, that was like an original test for how her makeup would look, and they rejected it, but they were like, but that looks sick for Pazuzu or something. Yeah, it does. It looks great. Oh, my um, God, fantastic. Also, kind of uh, has Bubba teeth. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the eyes are terrifying. What if the, what but if the, the te- demon the teeth- smiled and it was just like Bubba teeth? <laughs> Bubba teeth. Like, the eyes of the demon, utterly mortifying. The teeth, kind of Bubba. <laughs> Little bubble. This nightmare, I think, indicate because again, this movie does a great job of of maintaining subtext and not saying these things outright. I yeah. think Karis thinks his mother is in hell. Yeah, like, he thinks that she died. Well, subway is went, underground and so on. Yeah, yeah, she died and she went to hell, and and wow. it's all his fault. Is is what I think is going on here, uh, and. In his dream, we suddenly hear Reagan screaming, and it cuts great, great transition to uh, Reagan in the doctor's office fighting with the nurse and the doctor, uh, and and they give her a shot, and she's, Reagan spits in the doctor's face and calls him a fucking bastard, and it's awesome. She's getting a, <laughs> she's getting a little surly with him. And then we, we get the doctor talking to Chris, and he tells Chris that Reagan has a problem in her temporal lobe. While he's smoking uh, a cigarette. Yeah. The doctor <laughs> yeah, while he's smoking, smoking uh, inside a hospital. Because this is yeah. how life was. Because the 70s are fucking disgusting. <laughs> he says that this she's got something in her temporal lobe. It's going to cause hallucinations and uh, convulsions. Uh, he dismisses the the uh, entire thing about the bed. Yeah, he's like, eh, he, no. Okay, here's here was what was interesting to me. He says she has a lesion in her temporal lobe, but it's interesting how he says it. He says lesion, lesion in the temporal rope, oh, like uh, le- lobe. Oh, like legion. Like, like legion, yeah, which is wow, another yeah. biblical reference to the name of the group of devils that were possessed a man in Luke chapter 8, and and uh, Jesus exercises the devils and sends them into a herd of swine that then kill themselves. The class, the, wow, holy shit, that's kind of relevant for later too. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So like, I think I think it's intentional. The way he says it um, yeah. seems very intentional. Wow, I hadn't thought about that. You got them insights. Um, you got them insights. Hey man, I I was a Christian missionary once. Yo. <laughs> some some of them cats out there, they got ups. You got ins. Yeah. You got them ins. That's right. You guys <laughs> take your ups, your downs, your sideways. I got ins. <laughs> and so then we have Reagan. She's in like surgery prep, and the doctor's doing inje- injections and like oh my poking God. shit in her neck. This makes me want to die. Ben, Here's the thing, man. This makes me want to die. Like, I don't know oh. other movies where they show... Medical procedures like this? Well, okay. How about little kids yes. getting fucking stuck in the neck with needles and being in pain and shit? Yeah. Yeah, that... It's, I have, it's not nice to watch. Like, I felt bad. Yeah, I, I have a definite issue with the fact that I have veins and blood. You've, uh, always, you've always disliked I've, those things about yourself. I've... Mm, gosh, people... <laughs> Need to stay away from veins and blood. I'm just saying. I'm not. I'm not even like an intramuscular shot. Don't even think about it. Doesn't bother me at all. Uh, but the the second I see a needle go into a vein, Ugh. it makes me want to die. And when they stick it in, remember they stick in the uh, the catheter, and blood just starts spurting out. It's kind like, of shooting. just spurting. Uh, and they're using that really like primitive ass MRI machine that just sounds like a bunch uh, of like fireworks going off or some shit. Yeah, it's so loud. Really startling. And that's the thing is like it'd been super quiet up to then. Uh, mm-hmm. And then yeah. it gets really loud and fucking scary. It's crazy. And I, I like what Friedkin does here where he cuts from the loud machine, etc. to the images that it produced. Um, right. I, 
I, I like that he just sort of gives it to you to look at for yourself for a second. Like, yeah. to see, like, okay, you know, what, what is this? Like, is there something in her brain? And they There's don't find a lesion. They don't yeah. find anything in the brain. And then we um, cut to Reagan at home, and she's having a fucking crazy fit. And, um, uh, and she's got and she's sc- fucking weird She's, like, voice screaming and, like, yeah, it's crazy. And that's when she says, like, the sow is mine and fuck me. Yeah. Like, again, uh, with the, the weird hypersexual stuff going on from a fucking young girl that is way fucked up to see. Chris wants to know what would make her body contort like that. And the yeah. doctors, they they have more rational explanations. I think this jo- this movie does a good job of setting up that the doctors are actually they're not incompetent but they're unable to look past their scientific training right they're unable to see another possibility and in fact one of the things that uh goes on throughout this movie is anytime psychiatry is mentioned it's mentioned as like uh, like an evil th- word like it's a, it's almost right. like a bad word to the doctors like they, right. they tell her not to jump to psychiatry at once at one point which is like what do you mean like it, it's not like alternative medicine we're not talking about like she's not gonna go drink colloidal silver like she is it's psychiatry it's a fucking science right um i find it really interesting that the movie kind of does set up the idea that there there needs to be a more emerging of the religious mind and the scientific mind. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, this movie never it never goes full religious. Karis, Karis is the only one who can handle this demon, and and he he is the more logical, rational thinker. So, like, right. I think I think it's setting up that these doctors need to uh, learn to accept that there are some things they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And then we're back in the home, and like the lights are flashing, and Chris goes up to Ray's yeah. room, and like the window is open, even though it's freezing cold. The phone's ringing, but like nobody's on the other end. Uh, oh, and we also see a flash of the demon too when she's in the kitchen when she first comes in. I don't think I remember um, that. Yeah, it was it was in like just a real brief flash. It doesn't do like the full screen. It's in the background. There's just a real brief brief flash of the what? demon's face. I didn't see that. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. Um, and then so we find out, that's when we find out that Burke is dead. Like that he yeah. fucking was dead. And he was drunk, but his fucking neck was broken and all this stuff. Yeah. So okay. So what happened? Like, what is the story here? Did uh. Did, did Reagan, like the demon and Reagan, kill Burke? Uh, if so, why was Burke in her bedroom? That's odd. Right? Okay, that's a big question that I have too, because like he had been yeah. told to leave the party and shit. Um, the door to leave isn't upstairs in Reagan's room. Was he like trying to nope. like fuck with her or something? I don't know. Well, I mean, this is he's. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is an interesting part of this movie that is so ambiguous. Um, but you're right. It makes sense that Carl was just like, I'm going to follow this fucking guy out here and fucking kill yeah. his ass. Yeah. He's always calling me a Nazi. I mean, you know, maybe yeah, it was. Him. Who knows? <laughs> um, the Burke's murder. <laughs> this is something that happened so much in seventies movies where they suddenly introduce this major storyline, like halfway through the movie. We're, we're at the halfway point, And now, uh, there's this murder. And we're introduced to a detective in a little bit, and a yeah. whole new storyline that plays out. Yeah, kind of a kind of a weird beat, really. Um, I just have him in my notes as PI. I don't even remember what his name was. This is like where everything comes together here because Burke just died, um, and, and and Chris is really devastated by it. And just as that's happening, Reagan crawls down the goddamn stairs backwards and spits blood out of her mouth. That's sort of an unusual thing to do. Yeah, not normal. Um, I didn't like that. So, yeah, there's this is like this crescendo of craziness where it's like Chris realizes I got to get some fucking help. <laughs> okay, let me ask you because we should we actually should have mentioned this earlier. Which cut did you watch? I watched the director's cut. Uh, so there are a couple of extra scenes in there, but nothing nothing major. 
Okay, see, I watched, I found through rental on Amazon, I found the original theatrical cut. Yeah, uh-huh. And it didn't have the, the crab walk scene, but I watched it later on <gasps> online. Oh, yeah. It, but I didn't uh, see it in That's insane to me that that wouldn't be in there. Well, they said that they had they said they said had real trouble hiding the wires. Like, they said no matter how they tried to edit it, you could always see the wires. But, of course, digitally, they could fix that. I, I agree in the end. I mean, uh, when you when you have a movie that has such great effects, makeup effects and things, yeah. if one of the effects looks a little cheesy and you can Takes cut it, it get rid of it. Like, just yeah, I like, it. I, I like that they were uncompromising like that. We're like, yeah, this doesn't look as good as everything else, so just don't even use it, even though it's mad, iconic, and terrifying as fuck. Yeah. Um, and so this is when they go see the psychiatrist. Yeah, he's got <laughs> Reagan under hypnosis and stuff, right? Yeah, and here's my issue already with this psychiatrist. First meeting, he goes to hypnosis? This guy's not a psychiatrist. <laughs> this guy <laughs> is a he's a fucking quack. He's a flim flam artist. Um Snake oil. He, yeah, he's selling some snake oil. Um he wants to talk to, to Captain Howdy, uh, and a picture of Reagan falls off the mantle and Reagan begins growling. Like this demonic just growl like an animal uh huh and apparently a stench is coming out of her mouth because uh if if you pay attention her her mom covers her nose and she's like ugh like there's apparently like uh, just this stench coming out of her mouth which is also a sign of possession um, yeah that's something that's in a lot of those reports of yeah what? um her face gets like super demonic and she grabs the psychiatrist by the dick and <laughs> the doctor, the doctor wrestles her to the ground. Um, it's an interesting scene. She's just sucking just whole handful of dick. I, again, I can't think of any, any movie that could come out today where a, how old is she? Like 11? Uh, she's 12 in the, in the movie, the character swab, but uh, Linda Blair, I think she turned 13 while they were filming, but yeah, she's grabbing a, a grown a man, a baby. By she's the a dick. baby. Yeah. That's, um, that's not things you see in the talkies, man. It's just, there's no, there's it's so, not. there's so much stuff in this that you, you just don't see. That's disturbing. We cut to, uh, Karis running on a track. Um, and he's wearing Chuck Taylors and I'm just so worried about his feet. The man's oh, they're flat as hell, man. He's destroying his fucking feet. He is. They got it. They've got to stink and hurt and just. Oh, he he meets now the um, PI the, guy, the, right? The detective. His name is uh, Detective William Kinderman, though that name never really comes up again. They just no. call him detective, basically. Yeah. Um, and he's investigating Burke's death. Yeah. And this is interesting. This guy. What we learn about this detective is that he's very perceptive and he also likes to play mind games with people right uh, but we don't we don't get exactly what he thinks is going on ever he never gives us like his theory fully yeah uh, never like, I except, bet it was that reagan yeah except initially here he gives a sort of like early theory um he says that he thinks that maybe it's a disgruntled priest who did the uh did the uh de the um uh, desecration of the statue and uh killed Burke. Right. Uh, and and he he does seem to think that there is not not a demonic element to it but that there's like a a, a witchcraft element like it's somebody who thinks that they are a witch. Right. Um or a satanist. So uh, this he has is interesting. Damien to go to the movies. Like, do you like movies? Let's go to a movie. Okay, these things are important. Uh, so important. What he says to him first is that he tells Karis that he looks like John Garfield in Body and Soul. Look it up. He does. He does look like John Garfield in Body <laughs> and Soul. Uh, uh, and and th that is interesting because John Garfield. Uh, John Garfield's career was ruined by the House Un-American Activities, um, where th they asked him to name names. He refused to name names, and he was blacklisted in Hollywood. Uh -huh. His career ended. Basically, what 
I said, was saying about the mind games is the detective is playing a mind game with him right now. He's saying, I am questioning you and you need to answer me or your career could be destroyed. Yeah. Um, same, yeah. And it's real interesting because Karis catches it. Parallels. He catches it. Yeah. And he, he catches it and he's, he's obviously not as intimidated as the detective would want later. It, whenever they start to, Fit. And whenever they end their conversation, he says, you know what? You look more like Sal Minio. Now, a lot of people wouldn't know this. He just called him gay. Like he was just saying to him, you know what? No, you look more like a, you more, you're more like a homosexual. I was wondering um, what the relevance of those names was. Cause I mean, it was yeah. really just like, let's say the yeah. first and last names. Sal, Mini- Sal Minio was like one of the earliest out gay actors. Uh-huh. And it also fucked up his career. Um, Damn. So again, he's referring like I will fuck up your career, and I'm calling you gay. Like, wow. you know. Like, um. So I think this scene, like I, initially I was like, he's threatening him, really. Yeah. Well, initially I was like, why is why are they even introducing introducing this detective? But the more I looked at this scene, I realized like, oh man, this is a well constructed like well, tense. It- and you know See. what? It makes sense too, because that's why he like asked him if he likes to go to the movies. He's like, "Will you know these yeah. references if I make them?" Is what yeah. he was asking. Yeah, yeah, wow. that's exactly it. Yeah, he's like, "Okay, so you know, so this is what I'm saying to you." And then he does this thing, which is uh, he's very charming. This detective guy is charming. Uh, he he says, "Hey, uh, you want to go see a picture with me?" Uh, he says he's going to go see Othello, starring uh, Groucho Marx and Lucille Ball. <laughs> Yeah, what the fuck? Now, that is not a movie. That's not a movie. It's like a joke. He's making a joke. Um, and Kar- and Karis takes it as that. It's a joke. He Again, I think he's testing him. He's like, okay, so does he really know movies? He really know what I'm saying to him? Yep. Uh, and That's he does. Exactly he does. He gets it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, wh- what was the next scene after that? That's where we have Reagan uh, at the clinic. And, you know, they're asking if they have any religious beliefs. Um, right, because, because yes. they're like you know. Sometimes when people are religious, like they'll hear something like "oh, demon possession," and they'll think about yeah. it enough to where they get possessed. And sometimes an exorcism can exorcism can make them think that they're cured, um, yeah. which is totally on the nose. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a good, uh, interesting theory. But yeah. Chris. Uh, addresses it exactly as I would. She basically says, "So you you want to send me to a witch doctor? Yeah, like you you because she's not religious. She and, and she also is confused as to why they would think that Reagan would have some sort of uh religious affiliation. Yeah, because she's just a kid. She's not raised her religion. Yeah, so which is which is an interesting. It's an interesting kind of thought that I've had forever too. That you know of all of all the you know. 3,000 plus gods that have ever been believed in, you know, on earth ever. Yeah. Like, why is it that people always get possessed by the ones that they believe in? Like, why is it that, <laughs> you know, some kid in the middle of yeah. Ohio never gets possessed by, like, the African spider god or some <laughs> vengeful Japanese spirit and starts speaking? And you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. They, you know, people. People in those cultures get possessed by those spirits. How convenient. <laughs> it's because demons demons are really, like, nationalistic and racist. Like, they only like to hang out with their own kind. <laughs> oh, kind of like people. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> she finds the crucifix under Reagan's pillow. Uh, Where the fuck does that come from? Again, um, I listen, I I went to in into too much depth with some of these things. I noticed that the crucifix had a skull and crossbones at the bottom. What? Uh, yeah. What's which that I mean? thought that's that's odd. Um, actually, apparently it's not. Um, the type of crucifix that has a skull and crossbones that is um uh, like the the exact one in the movie, uh, they date back to Germany to the 1920s or earlier. So. Really? Germany, 1920s or earlier, she asked Carl if he put it under there. It, he did, right? Like, he did. That would have Even been though his he wares. says he didn't, he did. Huh. Like, wow, either he that, did that or the other servant did. Of a German. 
Yeah. The skull and crossbones, which I thought, what, what is this, like a pirate crucifix? That's fucking awesome. Uh, it <laughs> apparently represent, it represents Golgotha, the, you know, hill skull. on which, yeah. That's rad. I didn't so, know that. That's cool. He finds something in the grass, right? Yeah, and if if you look up if you look up Pazuzu, it's a Pazuzu pendant um, or a replica of a Pazuzu pendant. Which, uh, why? Okay, why is that there? What happened here? Um, I don't. I didn't understand that either. I didn't get that. Yeah, I mean, the assumption would be it had to had something to do with Burke's death because it right. was found where Burke's body was found. Yeah. I don't understand where that came from. Well, he he looks up at Reagan's bedroom window near the top of the stairs, and he's putting some stuff together. Yeah. Uh, and so he goes he goes to see the family and ask about Reagan's condition, and uh, it makes it clear that he believes that Burke was killed. And he says he was killed by a very powerful man because yeah. he believes that Burke's neck was broken before he uh, went down the stairs. So. His theory is that Burke's neck was broken. He was thrown out of Riggins window, uh, rolled down the stairs, and was found there dead. Which Carl is no small man. No, he's not. And and they, um, you know, it's a, entirely possible that Carl kills. <laughs> like and Burke maybe, seemed kind of like a weenie. I think you are onto something here. Like maybe uh, Carl walked in on Burke uh, molesting Reagan or something. Like right? I, I yeah, don't exactly. Know what happened? But, like, it's so interesting. Like, that element of the story just sticks with me. What is happening? <laughs> yeah, there's something there. That's a good point. And uh, he leaves, and Chris goes in Reagan's room, and there's, like, poltergeist level just shit flying fucking everywhere all over the room. Yeah. Um, and, and Reagan is also stabbing herself in the crotch with a, a cross. Yeah, she is just going to town i mean not not in any sort of pleasurable way uh it it is it is a violent like stabbing i know that people always kind of again i've never seen this before but pop pop culturally will reference this as the masturbating with a cross scene but i don't think this is any type of regular female masturbatory style it's uh (laughs) it's it's intense (laughs) yeah uh the demon is saying let jesus fuck you Dude, and it's like uh, making yeah. a twelve-year-old, maybe thirteen-year-old actress say and do these things is extremely bothersome to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, yeah. It's definitely an issue. Like, um, it's a child. You just. It's like it's. It's really fucked oh, up. Oh, you just don't see that that much anymore. Like, it, even no. when we we're watching, like, uh, you know, The Witch. Like, those little kids in The Witch, they're little bitty kids. But if you yeah. pay attention to what scenes they're in, they're not in any really scary scenes. No. Uh, She's I in think the, the most scary thing scenes. would have been when Willem, like, picked up uh, the the son and said that, you know, he was going to bash his brains out or whatever. Like, that that would be the most scary thing that happened. But it, this, like, she is right in the line of fire. She's saying the lines. She's, she's like, uh, involved in all this. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. And she, like... And, 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 dude, just to make things more fucked up, like, she grabs her mom's head and says, lick me. Yeah. And then rams her head into her bloody crotch. It's, I can't yeah. even say that shit without feeling really fucked up. Like, yeah, it's mm. really fucked up. This is 40 fucking years ago, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's Jack. God damn it. Yeah, it's crazy. Um... Ellen Burstyn, uh, like, she gets slapped across the room, and Ellen Burstyn's reaction, that, this is where she, like, they, they pulled her too hard with the harness. Um, yeah, yeah, and, they had her and, in, like, in a harness so that when Reagan slapped her, she, like, slapped the fucking shit out of her across the room. Like, the scream is, like, a real scream of pain. She's in genuine pain. Um, yeah. And she actually was very angry that they used that take. Uh, anyway, then so... Her- Reagan's head turns around. Yeah, she closes the uh, nearby chair, like, closes the door, and, yeah, she um, almost crushes her mom with an armoire, and her head turns completely around, which um, is it's a really, like, if you pay attention, like, a really good job of on the effect. It doesn't look like a fake head uh, spinning around. I'm not sure yeah. exactly how they did it, but... 
uh, it looks really good. It looks very convincing. Um, yeah. I think this is a it, scene, though. The thing are, about it, too, is, is, like, again, if this is in, like, a modern movie, and they're like, oh, and then we'll have a scene where head spins around, they give you, like, fucking ten different angles of it, and it would be all yeah. crazy and shit. Yeah. But, like, it's that the head turning around thing is in here almost as just, like, a throwaway. And then it moves on to the next scene, and you're like, what the fuck was that? And it makes it yeah. so much scarier that, that basically the cinematography doesn't make a big deal about what you just saw. That's what makes this shit so effective is it doesn't make a big deal out of any of it. You see it yeah. and it's there and it's like you're in the room and then you go, what the fuck was that? I don't need to be told to be freaked out by someone's head turning completely around. I, I'm freaked out. Like, <laughs> so yeah, just the one yeah. shot, move on. I'm freaked out. You've done it. Good body horror. Great stuff. <laughs> so Chris and Damien go to the house. And this is where the first time that we see Reagan on the bed and she is looking really bad. Rough. She has, you know, pretty yeah. much any image you've seen of her, uh, like in a jump scare fucking, you know, flash internet game <laughs> that scared the fuck out of you. She has like the scars all over her face, her her yeah. eyes look really weird. This is the first, I think, full-on appearance of The Voice, which uh, The yeah. Voice is by Mercedes something or another. Mm. And that whole story is really fucking crazy because apparently, like, the woman that voiced the possessed Reagan was an, old, was an older lady, and she was apparently, like, a recovering alcoholic... But she huh. she went back under the influence of alcohol because she knew that drinking would get her voice gruffer and stuff like this. And she did it under the supervision of a of her psychiatrist. Like her psychiatrist was on set and on scene and stuff as she was recording her dialogue, basically Holy to kind shit. of keep I her. I didn't know any of this. It's fu dude, it's fucking crazy. And she would smoke. Several packs of cigarettes a day during filming of this stuff. Oh. And, like, eat a mixture of, like, raw eggs and vinegar and all this shit just to fuck her voice up. Like, her commitment. Wow. It's like she. That is insane. This late. I don't know. Her commitment I don't know who to she just is. be the voice. Just like, to be the voice. Like, she's not yeah. even. Like, nobody would even think about uh, who did the voice. They'd be like, oh, that's a creepy voice. But she fucking went after it. That's awesome. She committed like fucking hell to it. It's very crazy. And dude, the voice, I really. It's it, great. It's fucking incredible. And again, dude, like today, if they made this, she would have some kind of like Christian Bale Batman, you know, sub octave, uh, lo you know, low response filter and fucking distortion on the voice. Yeah. And, uh, just dumb stuff. Her voice is terrifying as fuck. It's genderless, it sounds ancient. Yes, it does. It it just sounds like, yeah, it, it sounds like the voice of something that has been around from the beginning of time and 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 is is evil. Like it it really does have the character of a demon. It's it's and great. I love that. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Story oh, dude, at all. check it out. It's so there's cool. stuff I'm forgetting. I'm sure it's fucking crazy. And Damien is like, "Who are you?" And Reagan says, "I'm the devil." And then Damien is like. All yeah. right then, we can talk. The way he says it is fucking fantastic because you can tell he you can tell he still thinks it's kind of bullshit. So the way he says it is so matter of fact. He'll say it later that like because she just said she's the devil, like that's an indication she's not possessed. Right, exactly. Because, yeah. And then like he asked her a question. This this was really cool to me as a, a long time heavy metal fan. He asked her a question about well, why don't you do such and such. And she says that would be too much of a vulgar display of power, which of course is a historic yeah. Pantera album. I had no uh -huh. idea that's where the name of that shit came from. I had no idea. Awesome. I had no clue. So she said that line, and I was like, fuck, like Pantera, that's fucking rad. I had no idea. This is an end. It is interesting. The demon's playing with Karis, but Karis is also playing with the demon. Like they're both, they're posturing. They're doing right. They're both doubting they're each other's power. Less, yeah. Uh, and the, and the demon uh, brings Karis's mother into it. He says, "Your mother's in here with us, Karis. Would you like to leave a message? I'll see that she gets it." 
this is this is an indication to him though that there is something more to this. Because how would Reagan he know? Asks Chris, did did you know? Does Reagan know? Uh, no, I was coming here. Did she know about my mother? And, and Chris is like, no, I didn't. I didn't even know about your mother. So, um, so he he sees there's some credence to it. He's not sure exactly. So back back at the back at the parish there, Damien plays the the tape that he made of of uh, Reagan speaking. He plays it for the other priests, and the other priests are like, yeah, that's just that's English in reverse. She was backwards. speaking backwards. Yeah. English, which is really weird. And isn't there is there something about Marin in the backwards audio? Yeah. Yeah, uh the the audio is uh give us time, let her die. I am no one, I am no one. Fear the priest, fear the priest. Marin, Marin. God, this fucking weird. So the name Marin is said. Karen he, Karis hears it. Uh but he doesn't know Marin. So No. Um uh, it, I'm surprised later that he doesn't mention, like, oh, the demon mentioned you by name. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That seems kind of significant. And so we got Damien back at the house with the uh, babysitter Cheryl or whatever her name was, and it's really fucking freezing cold. Apparently they actually did chill the bedroom down to, like, meat locker levels. And you got to think, again, that's that's the thing. And She's I'll, just in pajamas. I was going to say, dude, She's, it's like, like this is a little kid in, like, a night shift. Yeah. That they're exposing to fucking meat locker temperatures. I mean, this is just, like, on-screen child yeah. abuse. That's all this is. It's yeah. Fucked. And, and yet you... If if you've never like been on set or if you never at least uh, thought about how they they make these scenes, this is a, this wouldn't have been a, a few no. minutes. This would have been all day. This is all day. They were in this meat locker working on this scene. So and, and dude, that's that's, that's the rough. thing is like when you talk to people who are like, oh yeah, you know my whatever my uncle showed me this movie when I was ten, and you're like, oh you poor soul. You're like, how about I was in this movie? I was the goddamn devil when I was 12. <laughs> God, man. It's terrible. So they're in there, and the, the room's really cold, and that's when we get the, it looks like scarification help me. It just kind of rises yeah. up on Reagan's stomach. Yeah. It looks like it's been carved into her. It says, help me. Yeah. Fucking crazy. Yeah. And this, so this this really does convince Karis. He, he goes to his boss. Tom suggests that they bring in Lancaster Marin because apparently Lancaster Marin had performed an exorcism over a period of like uh, two weeks or something in Africa. Yeah. Um, and so we get the idea that since the demon already knows Marin, that this must be that same demon that he had dealt with before in Africa. Yeah. And it almost killed him. Uh, so that yeah, that exorcism like it lasted months. He's he's a intimate relationship with this demon. And Marin Marin gets the message, which you got you got to remember too. You know, it's not like he got an email on his fucking iPhone. Like this would have been, yeah, because he had a Nokia. Exactly, it would have been you know weeks <laughs> later with that Nokia rig that he got the message. <laughs> and it's cool too because it shows Reagan, and she looks like she's just patiently just waiting. It's like I'm waiting on fucking Marin. With his weird eyes, she's got the weird eyes and her cold breath and stuff. Marin arrives via taxi, which is the the iconic fucking shot of him arriving in the, the fog in the and mist the, yeah. and stuff. It's I'd again I'd seen that image for my whole life and then to actually see it, I'm like, ah, oh, god damn, that's what's going on. This is so fucking rad. He shows up at the apartment and Reagan instantly like screams for Marin, like the crazy fucking devil voice is screaming for Marin. And Marin wants uh, Damien to like gather supplies for the exorcism. He wants all kinds of gear and holy water and all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, you know, the, the demon will attack us psychologically. He's like, it'll say things that are real and yeah. it'll say things that are lies and it'll try to deceive you and so on. She comes in real hot with a stick your cock up her ass, you motherfucking worthless cocksucker. Dude, she's, I'll tell you this. Demons be rude. They're really rude. <laughs> Demons be rude. <laughs> Everybody needs to know this. this uh, listen, PSA. Demons be rude. They're rude. They're impolite. Very vulgar. You know what? I'd like to see. I'd like to see a demon dressed as a rude boy. Oh, rude boy. <laughs> <laughs> 
De- this demon is. <laughs> oh my god! Can you re re-im- reimagine this movie in the demon's voice? It's a rude boy voice. <laughs> <laughs> Stick your cock up ass, you goddamn motherfucker. Your mother sucks cocked in hell. <laughs> I re, I re. <laughs> Lord have <laughs> <and> mercy. <laughs> your mother sucks cocks right uh, near the beach. <laughs> right near the beach. <laughs> and so basically after that, you know, Marin starts the Lord's Prayer and Reagan just like spits all over him. And that's when she says to Damien, she says, your mother sucks cocks in hell, which... I had heard, again, pop culture, I had heard that line, and I think I've even been told that from friends slash enemies. Yeah, I enemies. texted it to you the other day. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like, I knew it was from this movie, and I knew she said it or whatever, but it's like, I didn't know that's because this dude's mother had recently died. Died. Yeah, and he seriously fears that she's in Yeah, head. and he's seriously fucked up by it and stuff, and then here's this demon yeah. saying, yeah, your mother sucks cocks in hell. That's yeah. That's way fucked up. Now, I mean, hold on just a second. Now, let's just think for yeah. a second. <sighs> what is going on with people assuming that sucking cocks is somehow negative? What if his mom likes sucking yeah. cocks? What if she's like, this, this could be worse? Some people do. Yeah. Like, uh, hey, I, I could be in heaven just sitting on a fucking cloud. I'm down here sucking demon cock. It's great. Maybe this could be worse. <laughs> Who are the people? Okay. <laughs> Who are the people in hell? Getting their D's S that are having a good time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is ACDC correct in saying hell ain't a bad place to be? Hell ain't a bad place so to be. So many questions to be asked. Karis is stunned. He breaks off the prayer for a few seconds. The bed drops. and You see the demon face, too. Yeah. And this is, again, I have in my notes, no soundtrack. This part's just no soundtrack is needed. Just yeah. let it. Just let you be in this room. Such a smart direction choice. To not yeah. make this feel like Just a movie be... for a second. There's actually very much of this that feels documentary-like. There's even like some handheld camera yes. shots during this exorcism scene that just feel yeah. like a fucking documentary. And he, Marin touches her head with his stole, the, the purple thing, and she begins vomiting green slime, and smoke starts rising up off of her body. Um, Karis takes the stole and goes and cleans off the vomit. I assume maybe a, a vomity stole is less effective. I don't know. Um, yeah, and so Marin gets back to casting out the demon. Uh, gets back to saying the demon's back to saying mean shit. Very rude. Uh, the demon's destroying the room. Yeah, very rude. And I would not invite this demon over more than <laughs> once. I don't think <laughs> it's a one and done affair <laughs> with old Pazoo. Yeah. <laughs> The demon turns Reagan's head all the way around this time, 360 degrees, uh, and we see the demon's face flash again. Demon taunts Karis. You killed your mother. You left her alone to die. She'll never forgive you. Ugh. These are all the things Karis fears. This is exactly what he's afraid just of, and the demon's just hitting him. Hard si- coming in hot with those hard psychological attacks. And he starts with the uh, power of Christ compels you and all this stuff. Dude, the, the the acting in these scenes is so fucking convincing. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how else to say that. The acting is fucking fantastic. It would have been really easy yeah. for that to be very cheesy and be very, the power of Christ compels you. Like, there's a lot of conviction yeah. behind oh, what's yeah. going on. Oh, and we've seen it done cheesy, too, because it's been repeated oh. in, like, comedies and things. Yeah. It's, we've seen it done cheesy, and they do it straight they're intense. They're in. And dude, that's when like Reagan hits Damien and they fall. And then one of the sickest shots that I had never seen, Reagan kind of like is on her knees on the bed with kind of her arms in the air. And there's this crazy fucking backlit silhouette of the Pazuzu statue from earlier. Yeah. I had never seen that shot. Again, it's like, dude, I had seen so much of this movie. I had never seen that shot. Kind of like the, the, the Mary statue shot. I was like, I did not expect this. I'd never seen this shot before. And it yeah. looks yeah. so badass, dude. It's just two silhouettes, and it's fucking rad. Yeah, and this this is what makes them decide to take a break. Yeah, like, and <laughs> like, break time. What happens there? This is interesting because of my theory that I, I don't believe Pazuzu is the demon. Is this godly protection? Because they are able to take a break after Pazuzu appears. Oh, shit. What? Yeah. 
the demon suddenly doesn't have power. And the Pazuzu appearance is not demonic. It, there's light behind it. Oh my god. It. Like, okay, this is so tying in with the other ideas that I have. Holy shit, that's okay. rad. Awesome. Whoa. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think Pazuzu shows up as, as like a divine intervention. Karis asked Marin why the devil would choose this girl, and I have wondered that the entire time myself. What happened even? Like, was it that she was playing with the Ouija board? Yeah, okay, okay, what, good, 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 yeah. Like, like, is that where the demon came along? Okay. Was the demon like, oh, shit, <laughs> Ouija board, perfect. Yeah, this is my in. <laughs> or, or was it something else? Like, was... And, and and so Marin answers. I think the point is to make us despair. Yeah. Uh, to see ourselves as animal and ugly, to reject the possibility that God could love us. Jeez, that's, uh, and, that's and dark that's exactly, as fuck. I mean, that's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. Though. I mean, like seriously, that's what it is. I mean, you see a child being victimized like this uh, for no reason. There's no reason she did nothing wrong. Um, even if she was playing with a Ouija board, she did nothing wrong. Yeah. And, and this, this devil is just putting it to her and, and, and torturing her and torturing her mother. And, and it's all with the idea of saying like, there's no possible way God could love us if he could let this happen. Right. So Marin excuses himself to go take some more of those pills that we saw him take earlier in the movie. And Damien goes back in the room. This is again a very interesting shot that i had not seen it's his it's his mother on the bed uh-huh kind of in yeah. the pazuzu face makeup yeah and it it really dis it really disoriented me because i expected him to open the door and to see reagan and he opens the door and it's an old woman it reminded me very much of yeah um in the in the original let the right one in yeah, yeah. which is one of my favorites there's that scene where unexpectedly the little girl throughout the movie looks like an old fucking crone for just a second. And you go, but it's yeah. just for a second. And it's like, this is totally where they got yeah. the idea for that. Because you go, did I just see mm -hmm. that? Because it doesn't show it again. It yeah. just shows it one time, for like a second. And you're like, mm -hmm. what the fuck was that? And basically what you're seeing at that point is that the, you're seeing that through Damien's eyes. You're seeing that the demon is playing tricks on him. And yeah. an interesting point too that um, that my wife made about that that part is that part where it shows the old lady on the bed. The camera angle and perspective make zero sense. That's not that's not how the bed oh. would look walking in through the door. I didn't notice. Like ba basically, when you walk in through the bedroom door, you see the left side of the bed. That shot is from the right side of the bed. It makes no sense. Huh. It's ve so it's like instantly super disorienting. Smart, That's great. dude. It's such wow. smart shit in this movie. That's the thing. Is yes, it is. It's it's well thought out. And and I mean, uh, uh, you know, Friedkin went over budget. He went over time. They ended up shooting for longer than they should have. Uh, but when you when you come out with this, like when this is what you get out of it, it's hard to argue. <laughs> That it wasn't After worth it. After you pointed out that he worked in, what was the department that you said? Subliminal, psycho. Oh uh, yeah, Blatty. He he worked in the psychological warfare department. It, you, yeah. you see how effective this shit is because again, little yeah. stuff like how that camera angle didn't make sense. It makes it more disorienting. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, his I, yeah. old mom, his old dead mother laying on the or, or sitting on the bed like growling, and. Yeah, she speaks to Damien in Damien's mother's voice, which yeah. is really fucking weird. She's yeah, and then she speaks Greek to him. Yeah, uh, and and finally Kara snaps and he says, "You're not my mother," which uh, ma makes Marin realize like, "Oh, he's it, he is getting uh, the demon is getting to him." So, like, yeah. I need him to leave the room. Yeah. So, Mary um, comes back with the cross and the holy water. Just right as this is happening, the detective rings the doorbell. Yeah. And this is so interesting because it's been so claustrophobic up to this moment. Like, you know, because the exorcism is just the three people in a tiny little yeah. room. He walks out of the room. And now now the, the real world is 
is invading. The real world is coming in yeah, and saying, the law is like, there. you know, they're also, yeah, I'm Johnny Law, and a murder is taking place. Um, Damien walks in, and so, Mar- this is a to me, this is a really cool, again, fucking cool directorial choice because like, da- Damien walks back in the bedroom, and Marin is like dead, face down on the bed. He calls the demon a son of a bitch, and he attacks Reagan. Now remember. He's a boxer. Yeah, he knows how to throw this a punch. This is a 12-year-old girl's body. Even though there's a demon in yeah. there, it's a 12-year-old girl's body that he is attacking. Um, So he just starts wailing on her, like just punching the shit out of her. Um, a, He tells the demon to come into yeah, him. Yeah, he's like, take me instead, take like, me. It's like, yeah. Yeah, and so the demon does. The demon's like, okay. Leaps um, into Damien's body. And, yeah, and just as it does, Marin's face appears in the window. Does briefly. it really? Um, Yeah, it appears in the window, and Karis seems to know that, what that means. I didn't know that. Karis, he fights the demon's control. He, like, fights the demon's control, and then he runs and jumps head first out the- Reagan's window and tumbles down the stairs. And, you know, again, is, is, this is Burke. I mean, this is what supposedly happened with Burke. Um, and so he's at the bottom of the stairs in a pool of blood. The detective and and uh, Chris, they come running in and find Reagan crying on the floor. Um, so Reagan calls for her mother, and her mother is, like, trepidatious to go over because she's still worried that she's possessed. Uh, but she sort of, like... She looks at her a bit, and she realizes the demon is gone. Uh, outside, police are arriving. Karis is dying at the bottom of the stairs. Marin is dead. The detective doesn't have any idea what's going on. He just stepped into a world of shit. Like, yeah. It's interesting because he he's so, like, savvy and so, like, uh, is so smart and capable. But as soon as he steps into this, he realizes, like, oh, I'm out of my element <laughs> i don't know what the hell happened here um uh all's well that ends well the McNe- the mcneils are packing for la and dyer shows up and chris tries to give him the the saint joseph medal and he says now nah, you keep it but dyer he seems to he seems to know what happened reagan looks at father dyer's collar and there's like a flash of recognition and she hugs him and then kisses him on the yeah. cheek um so there's like a there's like a she doesn't fully remember what happened but she knows there's a positive association with priests right. now. So that's that's good, I guess. Now the director's cut, I don't know how the regular cut ends, but the director's cut ends with Dyer and the detective just, you know, seeming pleased that everything Turned out the way it did. The 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 one that um, I watched it just ends with Dyer looking down that stairwell. He just looks down the stairs like, what the fuck yeah. just happened? Yeah. Um. The yeah. I I think that's probably a better place to cut it. Honestly, I mean, we don't really need to see the detective again. <laughs> so, that's this movie. I I, I was mean, fucking floored. Like I I know this is one of this is one of those that the expectations couldn't have been higher because like we said it's try to find any top 10 horror movie list that this isn't on i mean it's on literally oh, all yeah. of them yeah and most of these movies that are on those types of lists have again as a late in life horror discover have been at least marginally disappointing at least in the scariness factor the shining is one of those ones that yeah. is just like nope that's deserving of everything you've heard of it and same with like texas chainsaw the Exorcist is, is is one of those ones that is absolutely, absolutely deserving of everything you you've heard about it. And it's like, yeah, it is, it is slow. It could it could use, it could use a little editing, but I don't know. Could it? Because it it overall is cool. Yeah, I, I don't like know. that it's I mean, a lengthy package. I'm fine with that. I mean, this this movie, like I as a younger person, I certainly thought it was slow, and I certainly thought that the pacing could could be improved but i i don't know i think it's great i think i think it works um i think everything sort of uh seems important seems kind of necessary to establishing like the 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 progression of the possession and and 
also the all of the storylines i think um are are done well they they progress quickly enough it's it's that it's the 70s every movie in the 70s was over two hours it seems yeah. like um so you know pe- people were more uh prone to want to go sit for two and a half hours at the theater than maybe we are today well, hell you know we say that but it's like fucking how many marvel movies have been over two hours right oh yeah exactly yeah so yeah so like uh, i mean i i think if you know especially because this is uh this was a novel first that yeah. sold 13 million copies in the united states uh i mean this is like going to see harry potter this is like going to see right. uh, this was something that had a built-in fan base already um So, yeah, people are going to be willing to sit for two and a half hours. And I very much am, too, after having, you know, watched it and and really dug into it. Uh, This is a great movie. It affected affected me a lot and really gave me a different feeling than a lot of other scary movies have. Because, you know, there's there's some scary movies that will leave you feeling, like, grossed out. Mm -hmm. There's some scary movies that will leave you feeling paranoid, you know? Yeah. I genuinely just kind of felt bad after watching this. Like, and yeah. a lot of it had to do with the fact yeah. that they 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 made a twelve year old girl do all this stuff. Like, I I kind of felt like I kind of felt like I just like watched a dog fighting video, like a real life video of dogs. Oh, you, you yeah. know where I'm just like, Ugh. I hate that they did this to to anything. It this movie really did make me feel like I just watched like, oh, this is just child abuse. We just made a movie out of it. Like, I felt. <laughs> really bad for everything that happened to everybody involved in this movie. The real life people, you know, I mean the char- the characters too, but it's like the real yeah. life people I felt like were were harmed by the making of this, especially a a, a young person. Yeah, I felt I felt bad. Yeah. That's a unique feeling. I haven't felt that way about a movie. Yeah, I think it, it does. It leaves it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. I and it should, I think, uh, especially considering that they made they made sequels and we find that the demon never really left her so like i want to um, see those i haven't, clearly yeah. i haven't seen any of those either i i've i've heard the third one is actually that's what i've heard good. too um i have not seen it i mean i i i have to put it up there like a nine yeah. out of ten i would say yeah i'll would, I would do the same um, i'd say nine or nine and a half so let's let's dig into this for a second before we wrap up here because this is what's this is what's really been interesting me yeah what happened? Okay. What possessed her and how did it start? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. There are yeah. Okay, so what do, what is your theory? <laughs> okay. Now, this is one of those things that again, this being the first time that I've seen it initially surprised me is because I knew that this was a possession movie. I knew it dealt with Catholicism and priests and so forth. I did not know that it dealt with possession of a non-christian demon yes okay and this is Uh tremendously significant to me pazuzu is not in the that's not a christian bible demon no that's never mentioned in the bible like you said akkadian babylonian yeah you know god slash demon it's not in the bible and kind of like what we were talking about earlier, why do kids over here never get you know possessed by Japanese you know folklore demons? She seems, as they're thinking, to be possessed by fucking Pazuzu, a non-Christian yeah. entity. And that, to me, whenever again I watched this for the first time, I was extremely surprised by. Uh, I figured that she was being produced by, you know, possessed by a Beelzebub or Lucifer, or Azazel, right. or you know, just some traditional Christendom demon. She's not. No, and yeah, and that's an issue, right? I mean, okay. Like, now, how about this? Do you think the Ouija board summoned it? Because I think uh, the Ouija board is a fucking huh. red herring, dude. Okay. Captain Howdy. Yeah, that never comes up again, really. That yeah, and you like, know what? we don't hear her talking to Captain Howdy. No. Like we don't hear the demon like refer you know, to itself as Captain her. Howdy. The demon yeah. never calls itself Captain Howdy. Do you know what Captain Howdy sounds like? 
that sounds like something that would come from the imagination of a 12-year-old kid playing with a board that has yeah. been told will allow them to communicate with things. I don't think the Ouija board yeah. summons shit. I think that she was just playing with it, and Captain Howdy is just her fucking imagination. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think that at all. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I don't think. Yeah, you're right. Cause like, I could see the demon manipulating maybe the Ouija board to say things to her. But again, the demon wouldn't say, "I'm Captain Howdy." Like that's a child. Yeah. That's something a child would think. Exactly. Um, that's child's imagination talk right there. So. The Ouija board is out the window, and I, yeah. I, I totally think that that's like, a red like herring. Just like Burke and Karis. Yes, out the exactly. <laughs> I th- yeah. <laughs> now, here's an interesting thing, kind of based on what you were talking about, about yeah. what is Pazuzu exactly? Is Pazuzu even bad? Yeah. So, how did this movie start? <laughs> It started with a white westerner. Yeah. Digging around in the Middle East. Yeah. Digging around and burying or uh, uncovering things that were buried that he doesn't understand. Uh-huh. And he not metaphorically literally brings them back to the west. Yeah. And it gets more interesting too when you think on a soci you know sociological level these things that he brought back from the west these ancient things that he doesn't understand yeah whenever things that are bad start happening like this little girl getting possessed uh-huh. how does he try to combat them with western religion and catholicism yeah. With the wrong things. Right. <laughs> yeah. He's trying yeah. to he's trying to fight this Akkadian Babylonian demon with the only thing that he knows and understands, which is Western fucking Catholicism. He's thinking, Oh, I can solve this problem with my Western ways, which are the correct ways I can fix right. this. Huh. So right? this is a clash of ideologies. Uh-huh. And and the in the end the exorcism doesn't work. Exactly. It doesn't fucking work. Yeah. Because Wait, what? Yeah, because huh. the Christian God isn't fucking real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what the message of this movie is, isn't it? Yeah. The message of this movie is is that there are demons there are uh-huh. there are god there are deities yeah it's not a christian god though no. No. <laughs> like there's a there's a demon attacking um a little girl yeah and uh pazuzu maybe is comes along and helps save her yeah like and and then karis just takes the demon in and kills himself that, that, that's not a exorcism that's not a removal of the demon no uh it's just a he just challenges the demon to a fight basically <laughs> Yeah, which is all he knows to do because he's a fucking boxer. He was using the skills yeah. that he knew how to use. He literally beat yeah. the fucking demon out of her. <laughs> so, Holy shit. I know, right? Like, I was thinking about this earlier today, and I was like, am I, is this really what I'm thinking here? Is like, is this really what this yeah. movie is fucking about? Because the thing is, is Marin is having, or uh, uh, Damien is having this whole crisis of faith. He was fucking right. Yeah. He was right. Yeah, he was. He was absolutely right. Yeah. He was having and, this crisis and of wrong. faith. That there like, is, he yeah. was right and wrong. Like, he's right that he has lost his faith in God. He's right to have lost his faith in God. He's yeah. wrong to have lost his faith in otherworldly uh, and, and supernatural experiences and, and demons, even. Yeah. Uh, those things seem to exist in this world. But the Christian God does not seem to. He does not seem to have power. No. I mean, we we also know, because she, we know that Karis had reasons to believe she wasn't possessed that are never resolved. Yeah. Like, he he hits her with the, the non-holy holy water and she responds. Yeah. Uh, so, what, like, what is going on there? It's obviously not, it's obvious that i mean you're right that this movie is not positing that a christian god saved a little girl 
No. In fact, it's it's positing that uh, demons are running around, um, just willy nilly possessing uh, a child who has nothing to do with anything, just to get back at an old man who I you know it, it said that it took months when he performed the the exorcism yeah. in in Africa yep. and that it nearly killed him. He doesn't say that he succeeded. And you know, the thing is, too, is this speaks on so many levels. Even when you think back about that very first scene in the movie where Marin sees the Pazuzu statue and not understanding that Pazuzu is actually the protector type spirit, yeah, he, lo- I- he looks at it all fearful and shit. Like, I don't understand it and it's scary and it's not according to the Bible. Oh. And then later <laughs> on, like you said, when the actual Pazuzu statue appears, like in the bedroom and stuff. Possibly even as a protector thing, because she is weakened after that. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah, just before that, she was kicking ass, and then now uh-huh. she's just laying meekly on the bed. Yeah. It's like he saw it and didn't understand it, and therefore thought that was the enemy, not understanding that actually that was the protector. Yeah. Isn't that fucking That's crazy? That's great. That's a great story, too, because, I mean... <laughs> It, it doesn't matter in the end if uh, Blatty or Friedkin uh, intended that. Yeah. It's the story they told. It's yeah. the story in the end that they're telling. Um, and yeah, uh, I think in the end there's, there is a, a nihilism about faith and there's a, there's a, a nihilistic worldview in general. I mean, the fact that Father Karras, um, you know, he... he is only doing this because he feels like his actions have sent his mother to hell. Like yeah. th- these aren't the, um, th- this isn't like the, the motivation of a hero. No, <laughs> this is a motivation of an egotist. Like he believes that him not being at his mother's bed when she died, sent her to hell. Right. What? Right. Come on. Um, so yeah, like, um, I, I think there's definitely, the thing too that that makes even more sense especially when as you mentioned earlier when you position the fact that they named the girl reagan right yeah this mm-hmm. speaks so deeply uh not to get too overly political here but you got to think yeah. like it speaks very overtly about westerners this is mm-hmm. this is really just a glimpse into the fucking future of everything we've seen over the past decade Westerners thinking, oh, we can go over to this Middle East place and solve all these problems it. with our yep. great Western ideas like democracy. Yep. That's what they need. Yeah. Yeah, they need that democracy. And that's exactly what this movie is kind of a glimpse into as well as like Westerners trying or you know, Westerners trying to fix Middle East problems with their Westerner ways, not understanding shit. Yeah. And look how it yeah. works out. But I really like over. Oh, I really, really, really do like overall that kind of the the conclusion that we're talking about here that the the Christian the Christian God and the Christian faith yeah. that these guys are wrestling with so much. The reason they're wrestling with it is because it's it's not real and it doesn't. It's not real. Yeah. It doesn't actually work. And like what she got possessed by wasn't a Christian demon, which is why their Christian no. ways weren't fucking working. It's. I think that is such a rad way to look at. Like I look forward to watching this yeah. movie again with that in mind. I, I loved it. I really, really loved this movie, man. I'm, I'm definitely going to watch it many, many more times. It's gonna, it's gonna be in my, my regular rotation, and I especially look forward to watching it again with some of these things that we talked about. Um, yeah. In mind, I know, I know these podcasts are always very lengthy, uh, but I, I enjoy listening to those kinds of podcasts myself. And yeah, hopefully me too. Garnering some, yeah. Some humor and insight about some of my favorite movies. Yeah, I can't stand a thirty-minute podcast. No, I don't either. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like, you're wasting that's my it? time. Give me more. Give, give me at least an hour. <laughs> yeah, dude, or maybe um, two or three. <laughs> yeah. Um. So next week, we're discussing 1986's Sorority House Massacre. Just a little change of pace. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, after two two straight shows of a lot of religion, yeah, I'd like to just get back to good old slasher film i've never seen it so it'll be a fun a fun watch in the meantime you guys can get in touch with us on the social medias and let us know what you think about the show uh and suggest other movies for us to do please uh go on itunes and 
all that stuff. Hopefully by now our podcast will be on iTunes. Rate and review this podcast. Yeah. Rate that makes review. Sh- yeah, that makes us show up in them searches much better. Just be sure in your reviews, don't use any uh, uh, rude demon potty mouth swear words as iTunes will not hey, post reviews yeah. that have stuff about you know your cunting daughter and stuff like that. They won't post those, so don't don't use any bad words. Rate and review us uh, highly, I hope. Where can they find us on the social media, Steve? Um, we're on on Twitter. We're on Instagram at Dead Lovely Pod. Um, you can also email us Dead and Lovely Pod at gmail dot com. Um, email us suggestions. Uh, email us some of those potty mouth things you can't say on iTunes. Yeah, let us know the real, um, the real, real. Uh, dudes, send dick pics. Yeah, please. Ben loves those. Yep, yep. I've, you can follow me <laughs> on the Instagram and the Twitter at Ben Eller Guitars. All one word. Ben Eller, more than one guitar. Ben Eller Guitars. Awesome. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening.